committee is uh, Dr. Emanuel is the chairperson. Uh, Mr. Gentry is on it, Mr. Terry is on it, Mr. Vonte and Ms. Brenda. So all the curriculum people are here. And as we said before, that's good. Good. All, as we said before, anybody can ask a question or make comments, board members, but all the committee members are here right now. And we'll do this and then we'll go into policy. Couple of comments. Because it is, what, the night on Facebook or we can be heard. Folks, this has come back to me with some, me calling people and saying, how's it going or what's going on? When we're up here and I talk to Dr. Emanuel and nobody here can hear it, they can hear it out there right. because of these things here. And we might be sitting talking like this. That's picking it up. So that's just to inform those here tonight and I will tell the other board members. Uh, that's one part there. The other part that's come to me is there's been issues and Dr. Roberts up here talking and he doesn't address up here and he starts talking and then the next person over here, Mr. Randy, asked the question to me. The public's are hearing it from both sides and they don't know who's talking. So committee meetings or whatever we're at, if it's Dr. Emanuel, whoever, make sure we address that person and they can get one person talking so folks out there listening will know who it is and where it's coming from. But again, I will tell you my understanding, these things in front of you are very sensitive and they're picking up these little sidebar conversations that might be going on. So uh, just keep that in mind. Okay, Dr. Manuel, we'll turn it over to you. Good evening, how are you? Good evening, Good evening. Hi. Uh, To get our meeting started tonight, uh, we welcome all of you, both committees and the staff for being here and preparing the material for both committees. Uh, we would ask uh, Ms. Ferber if she would lead us in prayer to start our meetings tonight. Let us pray. O oh, wise creator, the author and finisher of this universe, we give it glory, honor, and praise. And dear Father, as we set out in our child territories, we pray for Bertie and New Hanover County, those that have been stricken by the aftermath of the tornadoes. We pray most of all for the students and staff of the public schools of Robinson County, for the school system in the state of North Carolina and our nation, that we make wise decisions on behalf of our students and staff. Father, you told us in Proverbs 3, 5, 6 to trust in you with all our heart, to lean not to our own understanding, but in all of our ways to acknowledge you and you will direct our path for us. You also told us in Romans 8 and 28, for we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We sitting here are the called to this school system. Therefore, we, sent, we ask your divine wisdom upon our decision making and all we say, do or think. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Uh, as you know, schools exist for teaching and learning, and uh, curriculum is very important, but it's very complicated. And if you're not sometimes in the groove of the teaching and learning, it, it becomes, I guess, to some of us, uh, very thick. So what we've, I'm just going to share with you the concerns that have been brought to me as the curriculum chairperson is this year, What's going to be different than last year? Last year, and quote, it didn't work. Now, if you've been watching any research or watching any television, you've heard people be concerned about the distance learning didn't work. Now, I'm not going to say that I really agree with 100% that because when you expose a child to something, they retain something that might not be but 5% of it. But what our parents really want to know is what's different this year? Are we going to have more rigor? Are our kids going to be ready when we do go back to brick and mortar schools or, and we do go back to testing? How far are we going to be behind? Are we going to be behind? What is our staff, what is our curriculum department doing at the, our Board of Education to make sure that our children are not behind? Uh, what are we doing about individual learning? What are we doing about children who are not up to snuff with other children? What are we doing about children in areas that are in EC, homeless in those areas? Uh, are we, what, what are the expectations from our teachers? What are we expecting our teachers to do? Another thing that parents are concerned about is accountability. Who's accountable for teaching our children? In other words, 
are our children accountable? Are our principals accountable? Are our students accountable, of course? Are, 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 is everybody accountable for our children learning? Are we just, you know, going through the motions because of this pandemic? I think that we're committed to make sure these kids are learning, but we have to put safeguards in place. And I do believe that in some things that we have seen that, that we are this year, it's going to be a different year. I think the rigor, we're putting that in place, and also the grading. We're waiting for more guidance, I think, listen to Dr. Robert and Dr. Wooten from the state, but it will be a different year this year And what generally tonight, they're going to address it generally. Uh, we won't have specific topics like we'll go to topic one, topic two, but what they're addressing tonight is the rigor and the grading. How is it different this year than it was last year? And I think they're going to have to encapsulate it to make it, pull it together and make it short, direct, concise so that all of our board members can understand this um, Tuesday night when they present it and also our public can understand this is a different year. This school system is doing everything it can to make distance learning as viable as possible. This school system is doing everything it can to ensure that all of our students have an opportunity to participate in distance learning be it through Chromebooks, be it through packets, and our teachers are committing their administrators in making sure that we do everything possible to reach these children. So what Dr. Robert tonight and his staff and the superintendent will address the rigor, how is it going to be different, as I said, and also the grading, and we hope that they're concise, quick to the point, and we are not going to expect them to go through this book that's another time for another training, but we just want him to answer those questions that they can present to our Board of Education Tuesday night. Dr. Robert, take it away. Okay, and uh, do, do not let the book in front of you uh, scare you because, like I said, we're not going to go word for word, uh, but we do want you to take this book home and please just as a reference when you are getting calls from uh, your constituents. I'm going to take the mask off so I can to please um, share this information with uh, your stakeholders, because like I told Dr. Emanuel, if we're all on the same page, it's easy to light your way forward. But when we're not on the same page, then it becomes a nightmare for all of us. So to, to that, uh, this evening, we are gonna talk about the rigorous learning and how it's going to impact our students for the uh, upcoming school year. Excuse me, Mr. Ro Dr. Robert, for interrupting me. If any board member or anyone else has a question, Please ask it at that time, because saying them to again, if you're like me at my age, you might be forgotten your question. So if you have a question at any time, please interrupt the process and ask it. Thank you. So like Dr. Emanuel addressed uh, uh, in her opening remarks, uh, research <coughs> says that approximately 76% of our students uh, in the United States, uh, parents did not feel as though that they were afforded the uh, education they deserved the last nine weeks of school. And I would say I would agree with that 99% of the time because it was like all of a sudden we just had to revamp. We had, uh, they gave us a couple of days. I remember we came out on the Sunday um, um, and we worked uh, late that evening. And then the next day it was like everything had to be in place. So we had to make a lot of changes in, in just a couple of hours. And so uh, it was a challenge for us. But like I have talked with Dr. Manuel, I talked with Mr. Craig, I talked with uh, Mr. Gentry, I talked with uh, Mr. Henry. And I think most of you know that we are going to do everything within our power that we are uh, given to make sure that every child in the house receives a rigorous instruction for the upcoming school year. And I, I, I know we can do that because we have administrators, we have teachers, we have support staff, we have teacher assistants, we have cafeteria workers, bus drivers, everybody is the custodians, everybody is ready to roll up their sleeves and do their part to make sure that we do much better than we did at the end of last year. So with that being said, with the all too likely scenario that remote learning must continue for some students in some communities, whether part-time or full-time, Schools know they must improve upon what they did in the spring. Parents and students' expectations for the experience will be higher, and all remote schedule must come a lot closer 
to replicating a traditional in-school experience for students and for teachers. That's true. Parents and guardians must have a sense of validity and reliability as it relates to remote learning. They are counting on us to make sure that their child or their children get the education that they so deserve. It requires much more instructional planning that we've been doing since April. It's gonna require a robust support for teachers and support staff. And we've been doing a lot of training the last few weeks, preparing for this uh, upcoming event on August the 17th. And regular adjustments to adapt to the needs of students, teachers, and families. So tonight, board members, Dr. Banger, Chairwoman, PSR will achieve its goals if we, and if you look at your agenda, if we just follow these uh, items that's on your agenda to rigor distance learning occur, we have to know what the three essential E's for remote learning are. We need to know what our remote instruction plan entails. We have to know how the remote learning, all that flows together based on what our instructional pacing guides are, our three week fast track initiative, and how all of what Dr. Banger said at the beginning, from last nine weeks to this nine weeks, how does that compare? So we have put together a comparison chart in there for you. And at this time, I'm gonna ask Mr. Cole if you'll get to the ease for me. So the first thing I wanna to talk to you about is the, the three E's. And like Dr. Mang said, we're gonna be brief, but I wanna make sure that you have a good understanding of what our role is. And I have the team here with me, Dr. Cummins, Ms. Susan, Ms. Katrina, uh, Mr. Davis, Mrs. Sinclair, Ms. Burton, Ms. Stoneman, uh, Mr. Coles here behind the scenes. We have Mr. Dale with us, uh, Dr. Burnett. So we're gonna to try to answer all your questions before you leave here tonight. So what are the three E's when it comes to remote learning? And you've heard these words before, engagement. We have to make sure that this year, our students are actively engaged in the learning process. That means that the teachers have to be instructing based on what the standards and the objectives are for that particular lesson. And they have to make sure that those students are actively engaged. And if they're not, then they need to find out exactly what's going on with that child. Why is little Johnny not participating? Call the parents. We, we can't wait three weeks later and say, oh, by the way, uh, little Johnny did not participate in the last three weeks. It has to occur right then. That's why Ms. Jadell with her support team, whether it's the social worker, the counselor, the, the youth development specialist, the student success advocate, the peer uh, men, uh, 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 mediator, um, the in-school suspension coordinator, all the support staff have to be actively engaged in making sure that we're reaching every child in this district. And also the, uh, the efficacy, making sure that we know what those students' goals are and what their desired outcomes are going to be. And then finally, equity, because every child in this county deserves the same as if you are in the northern part of the county, the western, the eastern, the southern. We have to make sure all students get the same education because and have the same opportunities to get the same education. That is so important. So the efficacy piece, the engagement, the equity are what we call the three essential pieces. Like I said, I'm not going to read everything in the book. But I just wanted to highlight what those three are because those three words you will hear throughout the school year. Dr. Longley. Engagement and Ma equity. Ms. Ferry. Dr. Longley. Yes. And the students that where lives where there is no internet coverage good, could you talk about that? Yes, and Agent I don't want to steal Ms. Uh, Karen Brooks for her okay. presentation. Okay. But yes, she's going to be talking about that. Okay. In, Thank in you. Her section. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so at this time, we're going to ask uh, Dr. Cummins. She's going to come up and she's going to talk about our remote instruction plan and how that plan is going to help us to implement those three E's throughout the school year. And then after Dr. Cummins, we'll have a presentation by our, uh, uh, I think it's Ms. Stephanie Hubbard. I'm going to briefly go over the remote instruction plan. Started developing this plan um, probably about six weeks ago. 
under the guidance of NCDPI. We submitted our first draft of the plan to get some um, um, correspondence back on the plan. They gave us some good information to add to the plan. So this is and has been a working document. The plan is very long. I'm not going to go over everything in the plan, but if you really want to know what our remote learning is going to look like, this would be the plan that you would look through. The wording in the plan is changed. Sometimes you will see remote learning days. That is talking about the five days that was built into our calendar if we were having a traditional year. So you will see that um, words such as remote learning days instead of remote learning plan. But there are 17 components in the remote learning plan. This plan was developed not by uh, curriculum and instruction, not by the public schools or all but by a team of parents, teachers, administrators, and central office. So this was a team effort. Every department had a part in helping to develop the remote learning plan. So we're going to start with number one, and it talks about how your PSU, which is public school unit, consulting with teachers, administrators, and instructional staff. Question number two actually talks about the training of the teachers and the staff on the effective use of remote instructional resources utilized by the public school unit. If you notice on number two down at the bottom we have our links there that you can connect with that talks about our instructional plan as well as our professional development. I can tell you that what we are doing this fall is in no way an image of what we had in the spring. Dr. Wood hit it on the head the other day when she said we were being very reactive to a situation back in the spring. We have been proactive in the situation here with our remote learning, with making sure that we had things in place to carry us through. So number three talks about defining and clearly communicating staff roles and expectations for the remote learning. If you follow through, that is very lengthy. It talks about every department in public school unit. If you go to number four, it talks about the PSU surveying students, teachers about their connectivity. We started this survey back in March. We have had many surveys to go out. We had them to go out through the district and also through the individual schools. Number five is PSU engaging and community partners on services that parents and students can utilize on instructional, remote instructional days, which includes community partners. Six is developing effective design and delivery of remote instruction in the professional learning community. Number seven is really important. And this, Dr. Emanuel, is really the icing on the cake. How is your PSU teaching and practicing opportunities for students on assessing and using remote instructional platforms and methods including how to locate, complete, and submit assignments. This plan shall include regular opportunities for students to use the platform and methods during non-remote non instructional days and to ensure student success during remote instructional days. This is where our fast track came into place. We have everything that our teachers need, and I have talked with you about fast track, and I know you're probably sick of hearing fast track, but this is, the icing on the cake too, as far as preparing our students for remote learning. Our students were not prepared for remote learning when they left our school building. We are going to make sure our students are prepared. They're gonna have time to practice their LMS, their learning management system with their teachers. So they're gonna be prepared for remote learning. Number eight, how is your PSU communicating learning targets to students on each instructional day and ensuring that the lesson designs provide instructional time, practice, and application? It will be a requirement 
that teachers had that individual, that face-to-face -face time with our students. It is not about packets. It is not about software programs that they can log on to, but it's about that direct, intense instruction. Face to face. We may not be sitting in the building, but we will be sitting in our living rooms, the students sitting in our classrooms, but we will be able to have face to face instruction with our students. That is key. That is what was missing from our remote learning in the spring. That's true. Number nine, how is your PSU ensuring that remote instruction time practice and application components support learning growth that continues toward mastery of the standards? We have our pacing guides. Nothing has changed as far as our standards. We expect our teachers to teach our standards for mastery. That has not changed and that will not change. Just because we are doing remote instruction, our expectations have not changed. The standards have not changed. We expect them to teach for mastery. Number 10, how will the PSU ensure that students with disabilities have access to remote instruction? This is, there's a lot of details that talks about our EC children. We do not want them to be left behind. Our program specialists have been working diligently to make sure that they have a plan in place that any EC teacher, any resource staff, our regular teachers will be able to follow and to help to meet their accommodations. Number 11, talk about how will PSU track and dependent on remote instruction today? How will PSU provide online and offline contact options for students to communicate with teachers or staff? We have our 1 800 hotline. We have that placard that's coming out. We are trying to address every avenue possible for the communication. The communication is key. Building the relationship with that parent, with students. We talked about that today with our principal. It is key. So we're going to use every avenue possible for the communication. The hotline, um, Google Meet, uh, email, phone calls, whatever it takes. We are going to have the expectation out there that our teachers must communicate with their teachers, with their parents, and with their students. That is a must. The communication is key. Um, 13, how will PSU provide technology support for students experiencing technical difficulties on remote instructional days? We have a plan for that. It's going to be the hotline and it will be manned. So all they will have to do is call the hotline and someone will be there to help walk them through the technical difficulties that they may have. How is your PSU responding to how the needs of our English learners, academically or intellectually gifted learners and students who have been identified are served. This includes our homeless. We have intense information here that talks about our homeless, our EL, and our AIG. We have not left them out of the pacing guide, which will also be used during our remote learning time. Number 16 talks about providing students and parents with strategies strategy and greater support success, which come falls under student services. 17 is impact on the existing programs, such as transitioning to post and college and career college. This is where we're thinking outside the box when it comes to transitioning. The principals, the schools have already started developing plans. They've developed webinars, um, videos. They are talking about YouTubes to help with the transition. We know that transition is going to be critical for kindergarten students, for those students leaving middle school, going to high school. That ninth grade year is critical. So there's going to have to be some um, creative thinking about how we can make those transitions very smooth, not only for our students, but for our parents. They have to know that their children are going to be cared for and that their needs are going to be met, that they're safe and they're going to get that education. So a lot of times when we think about transition, we think about our students, but really you have to think about the parents as well. Because not only is the student transitioning, the parents are transitioning also. 
So that's basically the 17 components of our remote learning plan that was submitted to DPI and was approved. And all the information there for you to read it. Dr. Cummins, let, let me ask you something. It may not be the time to say this, but there was some discussion the other day with principals about varying the schedules when teachers were online to teach, like some teachers just teach during the day, like when parents at work, and some of the principals were discussing that they were going to have their teachers be online many hours, like the hours like 6 to 9 p.m. at night or whatever, whatever. You may want to, maybe Dr. Robert or you or somebody just mention that to the board members here or to the public that that was one thing, that one complaint that was given that parents had to work during the day. They couldn't help those children who were at home, but yet when they came home, it would have been nice if they could have had some contact with the teacher, with some of the teaching. So some of the principals the other day mentioned that they were going to vary some teaching schedules of their teachers. So I'm not sure where that went. We actually had a meeting today with our principals, a, uh, and that was one of the topics was the flexibility. We do expect our principals and our teachers to be flexible. We do know that this is not a traditional setting. We do know that we will have those parents that work, and we know that those students at home will need that support of those parents, and it may be that afternoon. So we are asking them to be very flexible with their schedule. It will not be traditional. You will not walk in the building at 8 o'clock and leave at 3 o'clock. You may not go into the building till 12 o'clock and then leave at 8 or 9. It just depends. And you may have a class where you can reach all your children during the traditional school day. So that teacher may not have to have a 9 o'clock session at night. But you are going to have to be flexible. You're going to have to know your audience. And that's what we told them. Uh principal yesterday, Dr. Mack, is that if we do not allow flexibility, then we're not going to be able to meet all the needs because, like you said, parents are working. There are other issues that they're having to deal with. But one principal today on our office hours made a very good point that he was uh, his teachers met and they wanted to do something like on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but still meet the needs. That's great because there's flexibility in that, in that scheduling. And that's what we want because it's not going to be 8 to 3. It's not going to be nine to three is going to have to be depending on what the needs are for that particular community. It's not going to be the same across the district. It has to be the needs of that school. So you're right. Thank you. Yep. Dr. Darling, and it's just along with the same thing. So I get all the flexibility. So one size fits all is not going to work. Uh, you might have a school that's doing eight to three, and I'm saying this to make sure we get it out everywhere. Yes. This school might be eight to three with their staff there. Somebody else at another school might be one to seven. As far as the live instruction where there is interaction. Yeah. Okay, so that's going to be varied everywhere but throughout the county and in all grades K-12. Now, if you could touch on the other component, all these lessons are going to be recorded. Is it all will be recorded? That's our plan. Every yeah. lesson will be recorded. Yes, sir. So the teachers will be given information on how to do that or what has to be done, whether they are teaching from home or if they're teaching at school. It will all be recorded. So if they work from 8 to 3 and that parent's fine with going on there that night at 6 o'clock and looking from 6 to 10, they can sit there and look at everything yes. that night. Yes. So, and, and my point in saying all of that is just make sure we get that out ever how we have to do it that everybody does know that because you know two weeks from now somebody's going to say well i didn't know they were doing that mm -hmm. i mean i don't care what we do that's probably what you're going to hear but we just need to try to make sure with robocalls or whatever we can do that we get that information out now is there any other options as far as the teaching that's going to be out there is that basically it that's basically it. But what we want to stress is this. Even though we will record lessons, it's going to be up to that teacher to circle back around to those students who were not there for that instruction because you can listen to the, the recording, but you may have questions or concerns about what, what the lesson is still all about. So it's important that our teachers circle back around to those students who were not there for the face-to-face -face for that initial instruction, go back and say, did you listen to the video? Did you listen to the recording? What questions now do you have? 
because when they're working on their schedules, they're putting in that direct instructional time, but they're also putting time in the day for those small independent group work where they're going to be able to work with students based on need, based on data. And even for those students who were not able to make, say, my 9 o'clock ELA class, so maybe at 5 o'clock that afternoon, I'm going to have a small group and I'm going to pull that student in then. So even though we're going to have those targeted subjects at a certain time, we're also going to have those small independent groups that's going to be built into the schedule too, and that will be very flexible. That's good. Mr. Brewer? Um, I got a question around, um, you said you recorded recording these uh, lessons or classes. Are they going to be archived for just a certain period of time or will they be archived and just maintained? I'm really not sure how long they stay up. I'm going to let my sidekicks answer that. Go ahead, Stephanie. So actually, we have integrated Google Meet this week with Canvas, so they technically would not go out of Canvas in order to um, utilize Google Meet. Google Meet um, does have a recording component, and what happens is a folder is created in their drive, their Google Drive, and it is called Meet Recordings. So once it has um, replicated and it's inside of that folder, they will always have that Google Meet folder inside of their drive. So it's not like it's going to go away. So it will always be in that um, folder. And as a Google Apps district, we have unlimited storage in our drive, so it doesn't matter how much they took. Ms. Cummins, <clears throat> school starts the 17th, right? Yes. Now, say I'm a teacher at Red Springs Middle and I got 25 kids. Is that the first time I'm going to approach those kids on the 17th? Or how do they, what's the process? I mean, is somebody reaching to them now and, and Am I going to log on? I got 25 and 15 on and 10 not on. How is all that going to transpire? Our goal is that our. Excuse me, Miss Darlene, will you repeat his question? Oh, yes, ma'am. And then answer it if you don't mind. Thank you, Mr. Mike. He was asking, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mike, he was say, asking, what is really the procedure for our teachers meeting with our students for the first time are they going to meet with them as a whole group or independently or and if they're not meeting how would that look is that correct that's close enough yeah. okay. how they could be oriented yeah. yes so we have asked our teachers to touch base with their students prior to the start of school this is unique for all of us this is uncharted territory we may be able to get in touch with all of our students um, from August the 10th to August the 15th. There's going to be a lot of things happening all next week. But we, the expectation is this, is that our teachers will touch base with our parents and our students and start to form that relationship with them to give them that um, direction. Even though we're going to be having um, Google Meet schedule, we're going to have things on our website, we're going to be sending out messages. We want to make that personal touch. So hopefully, our expectation is that every um, teacher will touch base with every student and every parent to let them know what's going to be taking place with the remote learning. That is the expectation. We know that if I've got 25 students that's supposed to be in my class at 9 o'clock and I only have 12 after I finish with that class, I'm going to find out what happened. Was it connectivity? Was it they need a different time? Why were you not in my class at that time? So there's going to have to be that communication with that. So they know, they'll know how many students they should have in each one of their class, and it's going to be up to the district. To and, that's, and that's, Mr. Mike, also where the support staff, we talked about the counselors and the social workers and all the uh, support team. You know, that teacher can text and say, I'm missing four of my students. What well, a support Mr. Dale's department can reach out and try to find out where those four kids are. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we need to have accountability for sure. Right. And then follow up. So yes. on a daily basis, I got 12 today, and tomorrow I got 18. Where are they? So the, for each individual teacher will keep a, a daily log, I'm assuming. Yes. And the principal's going to come in 
at some point I hope and look at the records and see what's going on and the administrators will monitor the attendance yes, yes. Mr. Dwayne the expectation is that they are to touch base with students who are not showing up for their class and it's like someone was saying earlier they cannot wait for three weeks they cannot wait for 10 days yeah. they're going to have Fridays Friday one of the expectation on the Friday is that you're going to be touching base with your parents that's going to be a day that you can use for communication so hopefully they'll take advantage and they will not wait two or three days before they touch base with that parent that's what friday do. that's what friday's for right that's what friday's is going to do monday through thursday and friday will be the, okay yes mr Dwayne. okay will our this my little different question here will our teachers and do our teachers have everything that they need right now to be prepared for when school gets started or that might be another question for somebody else uh we uh, and they'll get into it their uh, section but we have been training for the last what ladies the last four five six weeks yes so we've been training for a while materials are rapidly coming in uh our k-8 materials started coming in dr cummins yesterday from curriculum associate so it's all coming together. So hopefully by the end of uh, next week, um, everybody will have what they ha uh, need in order to uh, start passing out materials the first week the kids come back. Because we're going to have to delay. Uh, we already know August 17th is the first day for students, but that may be the first day for distribution of materials based on the materials being ready to be distributed. That okay. And what about and what about the the kids? Will they have and do they have? the necessities that they're going to need for school also. Yes. And like I said, Ms. Karen's going to give an update on the uh, technology uh, report. Uh, we're going to have all the curriculum uh, resources that they need. Um, well, I jumped the gun. So I'll... No, you don't, no, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. And uh, making sure that uh, we do have that, uh, like Mr. Mike said, the connection uh, with each child so that if uh, there's something that we're missing that that parent may need, we want to make sure that we're ready to go with whatever their needs are. And we do have training scheduled for August the 11th where we're going to go into details with Fast Track, and that's going to help the teachers be prepared for when the students come back on August 17th. And they have the bones, they have the pacing guys, they have the standards. That's the bones. That's what they have to have in order to know what to teach. And we'll get in that. We got a, some presentations that a lot of this information you're going to hear, but uh, very good questions. Um, but um, Stephanie and Li Stephanie and Lisa, uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, the learning management system, that is the most important. We have to make sure our teachers are trained because if you don't have the background to to run that management system, then it's it's not going to be effective it's not going to be effective mr brewer and then it's um darlene i may be asking a redundant question but um when you say teachers reaching out to the parents and the students is is there one certain way that they're instructed to do that or do they have several options is it face to face is it virtual telephone call they have well, several options um you know we live in a world where social media runs a lot of things so um, we just got to have a new program that um, Mr. Cole can, he's probably already shared with you, where they can send one message out and it can hit five different social media outlets. So that's one, but they're definitely going to be using the phone. That's going to be a Robo another. Robo call type. Robo and individual. I mean, it's going to be a multitude of avenues in which they're going to communicate with our students and our parents. I'm sure that would be questions that parents will be asking. Yes. And that'll be part of our communication when we get to the uh, comparison um, chart, the communication pieces in there. All. Mr. Gentry and then Mr. Terry. I think I'm, I'm hearing a question that I have uh, already been at, being answered, not totally, but what is the specific process for identifying those students who have absolutely no internet connection, no access to uh, internet service? And I just heard Dr. Robert talk about delivering lessons. So 
In other words, to use an old phrase, no child left behind. Uh, and that, that's what we want, no child left behind. So my question in short is all the bases are covered in one way or another yes. in getting what the students need. Yes, sir, Mr. Gentry. We've done a survey uh, before the end of the school year or maybe right at the end of the school year to see the um, number of students that did not have the connectivity. Like I said, I don't want to steal Ms. Karen's pro uh, program that she's going to share, but uh, the principals have been uh, um, reaching out so that they know exactly who does not have access to uh, technology, internet, the broadband. And so, they, you know, Ms. Karen's department is working on those numbers. Uh, so hopefully, um, once uh, August 17th rolls around, the principals will know exactly who needs a, uh, a device and who does not. And also, Mrs. Gentry, the principals are going to actually be polling their students as they pick up devices, that they as they come to get their um, packets and everything. Do you do you have the internet service? Do you still have it? Because what happened last month, the right. situation may have changed. So some of them have said they've already got a um, one sheeter where they're going to ask questions. Um, they got questions to ask the students when they come to pick up their devices. And that's one of them. Do you still have internet access? So that'll be more current. Mr. Terry. Yes, ma'am. Can we, um, it, it may be a little bit too early, but I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about what a, um, what a synchronous session will look like in terms of, do we have like minimum standards, district wide, uh, minimum expectations? Um, we expect, we expect the content to be delivered um, in such and such a way where you've got maybe your cameras on or maybe teaching from the classroom or do we have like district wide standards for or minimum standards for what that's going to look like? In our next chart, if Miss uh, Stephanie uh, would, uh, I mean, yeah, Stephanie is up next in that uh, remote learning uh, chart, which is the next uh, item on the agenda. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Uh, and like Dr. Cummings said, this the 17 uh, components, uh, although she did a great job. Yeah. Get a chance. Please read that because, like I said, that was a lot of work that went in by the team members, and uh, just uh, thankful for all their input. But if you look at the flow chart, you'll see, uh, Mr. Terry, how all this, you know, how the curriculum, uh, based on the professional development, will equal the instruction, and that should be the third item in your package. Uh, these ladies, because they're the experts. Uh Excuse me, Mr. Robert. I neglected to see my good friend on the left, Mr. Von Day Lee. <laughs> no, we, we get. No, I just want to. Um, I was sitting in meetings earlier. I mean, this week, and I want you to reiterate to everyone here that the connectivity problem, the internet problem, it's a county issue. It's really not a not a public schools Robs County issue. It's a Robson County issue, and I just want to make sure that people understand that when you talk about in the rural areas and stuff that you are doing. We are doing and you are doing what we have to do in order to make it work. I mean, it's not it's not great, but we are putting stuff in the in the makers and in the hay to make it work for everybody. So I just want to make sure that learned a lot of lessons. Mr. And, and Mr. Craig had one comment before they began. We did learn a lot of lessons from the last nine weeks. OK, we were not prepared, but we are definitely prepared. So All right. This uh, four days ladies get started, uh, Dr. Darlene and kind of follows what Mr. Dwayne was saying. I know school starts August 17th, but now realistically, everybody's not going to have what they need the 17th, probably might not have it 18th. Nope. So are we going to be working in on how we say to teachers and everything, you know, we got to give kids a little time to get this stuff to be acclimated to it. I can't <coughs> say what day we starting, but there will be some time given for high school students and the K-8 students and then come up with exactly, you know, I know they're going on every day, they might be teaching every day, but they wouldn't be getting into, I want to say, the hardcore stuff that first day on August 17th. And, and like we said, Mr. Craig, next, the first week may be about the Gideon and Robert. I was going to say the three weeks fast track that's given them opportunity, even though it's all about remote learning, it's about building those relationships. Mm -hmm. It's about just going back and catching those focus standards and trying to give them a tune up basically before they actually get started with the standards. Um, for this school year. So that's three weeks. Is that K-12 or K-8? K-8. That's K-8. 
how, how are we looking at that with the, the high school student that's got a, whatever, a math class and starting off? Are we doing some just review with those students or how are we doing the, that? For the high school, Mr. Craig. Yeah, but we'll talk about that in the K-8, what that's going to look like for those 15 days. Okay. Because that's so important because if we already know that students are behind. We know that. They lost about eight to nine weeks. Hmm. We have to do some type of review process so we can see exactly where those students are in order to meet their needs. Mr. Dwayne has a question. One, one quick question. How many, how many children do we have in the public schools of Robson County? Approximately 23,000. Say it a little louder. Approximately 23,000. 23,000. Okay. I just want to make sure they can hear it so that way that they, they get it too, that this is not a district with five schools and 5,500 kids in it. So, um, thank you. Dr. Emanuel. It's Dr. Lockbear. Fair me. The students that we were not able to contact before, have we been able to make connection with those students and parents? You're right. Yes, uh, Ms. Uh, Hawks is there behind you, and her department has done a good job tracking because we did have a lot of students that left the state and some out of the country. Uh, I don't know exactly how many we still have to uh, locate, Ms. Jadell, uh, an estimate of how many. During the summer, we lose a lot of students because our county is very transient. They go from one side of the county to the other, and they don't have the and I wanted that stated because of some stuff I saw on Facebook about us not addressing it and I want to address it now. All right, so <clears throat> these ladies are going to talk about the, the uh, components of the, remember we talked about the three E's and how our curriculum and PD is going to help us to drive our instruction. So in order to meet the three E's of remote learning, we looked at three key components and how to link them together. One being curriculum, professional development, and in instruction. So the curriculum that we're going to use across the district is related to the North Carolina Standard Course of Study, utilizing the instructional pacing guides, incorporating the fast track for our K-8 students, um, our packets that we're giving out to the K-2, um, and also to 312 who have no connectivity. And the other programs that are available there, HMH is another program. As far as our professional development, we are going to start on Tuesday with our training for Fast Track, which um, involves pacing guide training as well, and we'll take a look at that. Our fall courses that we are offering, we currently opened that up yesterday, and we already have 500 people signed up. Those are the 500 that did not take, were not part of the 1,000 that we reached during the summer courses. Um, so that's 1500 that we've totally got now. It'll stay open until Monday. We'll close that out, a registration, because we have to take all of those names and en enroll them in the courses in Canvas, and that takes a little bit of time. With that being said, our fall courses that we're offering is the essential elements in remote learning for administrators, which is required. And we'll take a look at that in a second as well. Um, we are requiring all certified staff to complete a course on the introductory to remote learning environment. That requires what does remote learning look like and how can I provide um, support to my students. Um, we have digital connection in the classroom for our beginning teachers, um, IOT ones. We are also providing fundamentals in the digital classroom for our classified staff. We're going to open that up public because currently they don't have UIDs to log into Canvas, so we're going to make sure that we provide that public. Power Teacher Pro Gradebook, which is going to be a new report card for our K-2. We're going to offer a course in that that is required as well for our K-2. We have already had our grades 3-12 involved in gradebook previously 
However, um, we are offering that course to provide the setup since we're not able to actually meet with them face to face. We are looking at a passport to learning for our students and parents for K-12. As far as our learning management systems, we're utilizing Google Classroom and Canvas. And these are the types of instruction that we are providing within those learning management systems. We'd like to switch over and show you some of the things that we have created. There was a question that was brought up. And we'll take to see that one next. So fast track, actually this is called the connecting to digital tools. Here's what we have done. We wanted to make this public. So in order to make it public so that our parents, guardians, and grandparents could have access to it, we actually went in to our district website and on the tab that shows the Canvas Parent Portal, this is actually where they would go to log in. They'll actually select this. We created this um, link that says Browse Courses. There's already been a video created and put inside of the administrator's Canvas course for them. This will show any public courses that are available in Canvas. So connecting with digital tools will become public, is already public, so all they technically have to do is touch that and it opens up into the course. Good. So if I have a pre-K pre through second student, I technically would just scroll and I'll click here. And again, this is what we presented last time. Any pre-K to, there's um, information on how the student will log into NC Ed Cloud, which gives them access to Canvas and other areas. We provided um, how they can use the QR code to log in by the webcam and how a parent can create an account. <coughs> also, click Happy Lisa. Gmail, how the students will log into Gmail. There's actually um, videos where we are going step by step and showing that process. How they can reply to an email, how they can accept the Google Meet invite and explore Google app. Our Google Classroom is here because that is the learning management system that we're using for our pre-K. These are all videos. How to navigate in the classroom as a student, how to submit an assignment, how to edit it turned in, how to mark assignment is done, because I know sometimes that was really hard for students in the past. How to email your student on the or email your teacher on the student side, as well as how to accept the invite as a parent. So that helps the parent or the guardian understand what do I do once I've received that invite. We transition then to Google Meet, which is what we will use for our videoing, our recording of our sessions, how to do it from an email account, calendar, or actually creating it straight from Google Meet. We have our digital citizenship because there are digital learning competencies, North Carolina DLCs, that teachers have to meet. And though we want this to mirror just like it's face to face, in order to do that, we still have to meet those competencies. So by doing that, this digital citizenship, the link at the top, will support our teachers in, okay, am I meeting the citizenship of um, being digital? In the, in the realm. This here is actually for the students. They can click on it. It will take them out to different areas. Um, some of it is songs. Some of it is little um, programs or presentations for them to go to, through. And those are the areas that meets that requirement for the DLC. Our Chromebook basics. We have parents, grandparents who don't know much about turning on a Chromebook and how to maneuver things. We actually have videos on Chromebook Basics, Chromebook Basics 2, which is a presentation, 
how to get started with your Chromebook, how to search on your Chromebook, how to move between your pages, how to connect to the Wi-Fi, and keyboard shortcuts on there. When we go home, when we go to the 3, 8, and the 9, 12, they are very similar. The only difference here that we've had to change is, of course, the Canvas, because those grades are inside of that learning management system. Inside of there for both sets of grades, we have logging into the NC Ed Cloud. We have navigating Canvas as a student. We have connecting it with um, the pair observer, which is the parent, because there has to be a code to connect. And then navigating, how does the parent navigate inside of Canvas to be the observer? We also have, that's the same. We also have what is called our passport. So the question came up, okay, how are we preparing our students? In order to prepare our students for the learning management system of Canvas, they are going to take a course called Passport to Canvas where they will take a journey and they will earn badges for their passport. So as you scroll down, the modules that are set up is, they will start out in Salt Lake City, which will then take them through as they click the global navigation. Here's the key aspects that they will learn inside of global navigation. They'll look at the dashboard. They'll know how that works. They'll look at their card colors of their courses and know that they can change those. How can I add things on? How do I access my course? How do I change my notifications in my account? Once they get through with that part, it transitions over to communication tools. How do I communicate with my teacher? How do I read and view um, messages inside of the background of that? Then we look at calendar, announcements as well. We transition to Seattle where they'll start navigating through a course to see what that looks like. What does my homepage look like? Viewing the stream, my syllabus or my newsletter, as well as my grades, where is that tab at? They will then transition over to Philadelphia where they'll look at their assignments. How do I view my assignment? How do I do a file upload? No. How do I do a text entry? If my teacher has asked me to, to send it as a website URL, how does that work? And then we will transition over to quizzes, which is the assessment part. How do I open a quiz? If something is locked, what does that mean for my quiz? I quiz tools. How do I submit it once I'm finished? How do I retake it if that's enough, if I have a second attempt? And then the option of new quizzes, because there's two types of quizzes inside of Canvas now. What does that look like on that side? Then we'll talk about discussions. If my teacher decides that we're going to do a group discussion and have a thread, what does that look like for the discussion settings? How do I reply to that? How do I add a um, actual image to that discussion. And then we take a look at our grades. So how do um, I access my feedback, our rubrics, if my teacher creates rubrics, transition over to peer interactions. How can we do that group work, that collaboration side of there? Then we end at the bottom with the student app, which is one of the most important pieces where they take a look at what that looks like from a student perspective as far as the student app. How if that's all my parent has is maybe a cell phone or a tablet, what does that look like using the student app? Accessing my assignment, submitting my assignment, taking a quiz. And they will earn little badges as they complete each area of the navigation. We want to lastly talk about 
our admin course. This is probably one of the, I find most important courses, the admin course, because we have to lead. Um, so inside of our modules, we want to talk about this area a little bit. Because we, we've kind of added some things since we talked to you guys last. We want to provide support to our, our principals and our sister principals so they're inside of this area as well. Mm -hmm. At the top, we start with the Canvas LMS. We actually go in and give them a step-by-step -step guide. We talked to them about Google Meet and how it met Canvas. So they have an actual step-by-step -step process of how to do join the Meet, how to um, create the Meet and end the Meet. We talked about the single item sharing. We also did a video for them of how to navigate as a school site admin. We are district admin in Canvas but we wanted to give them the opportunity to have that analytics so that they can technically go in and evaluate that course and see how many times um, assignments have been submitted, how many times have my students been online, what's the mean for the um, grades that are going on in this remote learning that's taking place. Um, we talked about how and actually did a video on how to browse for that public course that we just showed you. So there is a video that principals can technically provide to their parents as well as documentation because we created a document with um, screenshots. Roll call attendance. I think the last time we were here there was a question about how can they take attendance. We provided three ways that teachers can take attendance and that be accurate so that they have the data in front of them. We talked about how to build a Google form for daily attendance and link it as an assignment and that means that they have a spreadsheet with the data on that, time stamped with email. We also talked about the extension before which is called the Meet Attendance that also provides a spreadsheet that's in the Chrome Web Store that they can connect inside of their Google Meet. But most importantly, we had the roll call attendance. We turned that on this week. It is not connected to PowerSchool attendance, which means they would actually have to take the data that's inside of Canvas and move it into PowerSchool, which they technically are used to taking attendance. But with this attendance, they can actually count the student present, whether they were late, absent, and it keeps track of all of that. And there's data reports that they can run for that. The principal also has access to the attendance inside of um, the analytics for the course. And one of the, one of the assignments that's not showing yet is our at-risk Google form. So just like if we were in a school setting and we would have to identify those at-risk students. We should be able to identify those in remote learning as well. So in order to do that in Canvas, teachers can use the course analytics to determine that. How, what, who is at risk because they haven't logged in for two weeks? What's going on? We need to fill this form out so we have our documentation. Do we need to call? Do we need to visit? What do we need to do to reach out to those students and find out, okay, why hasn't this student logged in in two weeks? We have Google Classroom set up for our pre <laughs> Also with videos to show that. We have our walkthroughs inside of there for our student, for our principals and assistant principals so they technically can evaluate the course and then the second one, they can evaluate the teacher and the student. We provided remote learning resources for them, um, which is the guide that we showed you last meeting. We provided them an, an example of a faculty protocol sheet. That means what do we expect of the faculty? We also provided a student protocol sheet. What do we expect of the students? Cole has an area inside of here for the PSRC Connect which is um, 
you know, what Dr. Cummings talked about earlier, being able to connect with the parents. We have our communication tools section, which is also a course that we provided this summer for our teachers. After the communication tools, which is pretty lengthy, we have our digital agreements, which we have moved from paper to digital. And um, we haven't published that yet. And then, of course, they do a staff evaluation to evaluate us and provide feedback so we can self-reflect and see what we need to change, as well as a certificate of completion, and they will earn a badge as well for completing the course. Um, excuse me. So you will see that, oh, excuse me, I got it. But go ahead and give your point. Um, so you'll see that we have followed a lot of the uh, social and when it comes to the internet uh, uh, etiquette, we have looked at the norms, we've looked at the standards. And I know, Mr. Terry, you seem to be really in, in intrigued there by some of the comments. So, because that's your area of expertise. And so, as, as the question was asked, what are we doing different than we did in the first, last nine weeks versus the first nine weeks? You just seen a major component of what we we're going to be doing different come August I, or August the seventeenth. But let me make one comment before Mr. Terry speaks. Mr. Terry asked made a statement earlier, asked a question about would we be teaching the same thing? North Carolina has a um, we have a state curriculum for every grade level and for every course. All over the state, we have to teach skills specific goals. So to answer your question, yes. Now you may have some children behind and some ahead, but we have to teach the same goals by grade level across the whole state of North Carolina. Right here, Dr. Manuel. Yeah. So it's the standard course of study. This falls under the North Carolina standard course. So you had a question, would it be the same? Yes, but now keep in mind you have some children who are behind. They have to review that, plus they have to teach whatever is outlined there for that course, for that grade level. That is state required. That's non-negotiable. Yeah. And Dr. Manuel, I did want to say with this, the uh, administrators have the ability to go in and evaluate teachers, just like we would do walkthroughs. Yeah. We're going to basically do virtual walkthroughs in these classes while it's going on. And they will also be able to evaluate the course itself, not just the teaching, but the course itself, to make sure that it is following the standard course of steps, that the components are there for an effective lesson. But they've got the two evaluation forms built inside here where they will be monitoring and evaluating during the remote learning. That we definitely did not have in the spring right. as well. And, and starting yesterday, principals have been sharing their schedules with us. So you talked about the uh, standards, the forms, the expectations, all of that. There is a checklist that the uh, team sitting around this table put together. So we have to make sure before they uh, present that schedule to their staff as approved, it has to go through a vetting process. And the experts sit here at the table takes care of all of that. Ms. Brian, Ms. Vontae had a comment, didn't Ms. Karen? Did you? Yes, um, we, we talked about you had 500, I think you said 500, um, 500 certified employees that took, um, that took the... We had over a thousand people sign up for the summer. For the summer? Yes. And how many of them we got signed up now for the fall? Is it so a thousand? In the summer, we put out six courses. They were offered twice throughout the summer. So that gave teachers an opportunity, or anyone who was certified, an opportunity to get ahead of the ball before being behind it, okay? okay? We can't require them to take it because it's the summer. A thousand teachers took it. And it introduced Canvas in three levels. It introduced Classroom for our pre-K-2. It gave them a heads up on how to communicate with our parents in all <laughs> And then on top of that, it gave Google Drive and apps. Um, yes, okay. This is what I'm going to lead me to my question now. How many, how many certified employees now that have not took the course and as a district? 
this is a lot of information and stuff. And for our, t uh, for our employees and stuff to be effective, I think they need to take this course. If you're, if you're a certified employee, I think they need to crash the course on this campus. Because this is a lot of information. You're teaching our kids, and you're teaching everybody kids. It's just a lot of stuff that you must go through. I don't care how good you is with computers and stuff. There's a lot of information that you're trying to explain to somebody else or try to learn somebody else. It's a new way of teaching. Yes. So the urgency has to be real, and this is why. Okay. Yesterday at 6 p.m., Dr. Cummings sent out the universal emailing address to all employees because now this time around, we're hitting everybody, okay? So universal, as everyone called the Rob Coway, right, going around, it went email-wise at 6 p.m. And by this morning, we have 450 people signed. Wow. All it did was just go out in an email link. So now we've pushed it all the way because it's open until noon on Monday. Noon, August 10th, registration will close. Because on that end of it, we have to make sure on the back side we can get everybody in. So now what's being offered? So now we have the administrators are already in. They just have to accept their invitation, but they're in already because boots on the ground have to come from leadership first going in. The next ones after that are a required teacher course, okay? What that means is that they're going into a different ocean this time. Before it was one way, now we're different, okay? So it's reading materials and links of things for them to start to ease their way in. First day back is on Monday for them, right? So then after that, we have different other courses that are there that will truncate through the semester. In addition to this, anybody that missed Canvas training over the summer, classroom, Google Classroom over the summer, driving apps and communication, have the opportunity for an independent course on their own self-paced starting Monday, okay? So they still have everything that was taught in the summer as a hybrid fast course for them. So at this time, yes, we have 500 in a 24 hour scheme, but there'll be more right. as we keep going. Uh, well, this is my Hello, question. And then Mr. Terry. This is, this is my question. So as a board, as a district, will we, this is my question. Will we, we will require all our certified employees to take this course. This, I'm just asking as a, as a district. So I just want to put that out there. We'll require it. I we'll think. We'll require that. I think the superintendent can do that. I don't think as a board can okay. require them to take it. Okay. Yeah, the superintendent might can do that. Sorry. And we have staff development. I'm sorry. Well, you can go ahead. Okay, I will ask. We have encouraged our principals, Mr. Ronte, uh, to make sure, and we just talked yesterday, if a teacher has not done the course, send us the names, and they have been collecting the names because we want to make sure every teacher Every teacher assistant, every staff member has the opportunity to get it done okay. for the kids return on August. So, it's turn in the book. And it's important to realize this much <coughs> too, that Canvas didn't just start in the spring. Ladies, how long has Canvas training been going on in our district? The third year. We're in the third, third year. That's right. It's been a few years. It's turn. We've been training on this for three years. So some of our staff are well uh, advanced in yeah. Canvas, because this is our third year of Canvas. It didn't just start in the spring when we hit remote right. learning. Uh -huh. Okay. They have been trained on it for three right. years. Mm -hmm. Trained on Google Classroom for five. Um, and to add to that, Mr. Leach, um, principals have requested today to have the sign-in sheets. We didn't do it for registration because that doesn't mean that because you signed up, you took it. Okay. But if you were in our orientation and you completed the form for attendance, then you were there. And so they have asked for all of those. We have provided them a forced copy, which means they get their own copy to actually filter the column for school. So they are looking into who has taken it versus who is not, so they can push that toward them to sign up. If uh, you would, Mr. Terry has a question, then we have to turn it over to Ms. Karen. If you want further discussion with these ladies, please feel free to call them or get them in the side or whatever at the end. But I think I've been getting a hint that my time is about to conclude and we have to hear from Miss uh, Karen <laughs> and then I have to do a wrap up. So Miss Terry.
I appreciate all of the uh, the good work that's that's went into building uh, building these these materials, um, especially the the you know the teacher training and the administrator training. The, the administrator training in particular in particular is, is of interest because system roll out the way that um, that. So we're going to have like district level access, and then each principal is going to be an admin of their own school. So that's that, I, I didn't know that that we were taking that approach, which is which is good. So my question now is, um, are, are, are there the principals, uh, assistant principals, or the, all the administrators at the school, are, are they going to have to, to go through your training? Um, because there's, they're going to have to know how to evaluate the online courses. And of course, they're going to have to have some kind of training on the admin side of Canvas as well too, right? Yes, sir. We've actually had several principals it's kind of lit a fire um, that want us to actually google meet with them next week so we have groups of them who we're going to meet to actually take them through the training of, of canvas okay and my next um i don't i don't know if this is the right time or not but i still i still want to um want to learn more about how the synchronous piece will work and do we have district-wide um, and minimum standards for how these synchronous lessons are going to be carried out because you know in online learning you can have the asynchronous piece you know that's good but I think it's unique to have the requirement of the synchronous side because this is going to be particularly important for, for, for our, our, our kids. Our supervisors are going to be talking next so that would be a perfect question. Is there anybody else that wants information on the digital side because we'll step down so that the next group come in. Okay real quick. Uh, folks, there was a school shared this information about how parents and grandparents like me can get on. And, and I usually won't say this about Facebook, but I will say it tonight. If uh, as a board member, if you got a Facebook account, now this is just my two cents, but if you've got an account and can go on to the county Facebook site and share what they were talking about, or if you go to my site, it's on my site, I copied it, shared it from somebody else. And there were a lot of hits on this last night because this is very good stuff for parents and grandparents that has, like me, very little knowledge of this kind of stuff. And uh, so, you know, as a board member, I think most of us have an account and to put it on yours, the people that see you or look for you, that'll just be another way of getting this information out. What we have put on our uh, homepage, the PSRC homepage, our principals can put that on their homepage. We share it on Facebook. But back to Mr. Lockler's question, that, Mr. Chair, I don't know if we have the magic pill for what you're asking for. That's going to come with experiments that's going to happen in the next few weeks because we gave them the allotted time. Uh, and I know the supervisor is going to share this, but based on the allotted time for remote learning, that is when, uh, when they do the synchronous Monday through Thursday, it's going to, we're going to have to see how that works. I guess that's my point. Do we, are they got that represented? Okay, so quickly, because our time is uh, winding down and uh, we've had some good discussion, but we just want to show you, because we have a lot of new board members, the uh, elementary and the middle school pacing guides. Um, we have pacing guides for K2, I'm sorry, for K12, but we just finished up K2. You've heard me for that at a uh, couple of critical meetings. But uh, we have been working on these for over a year and a half, and we finally have all of the core subjects and our next uh, um, area is social studies and we're going to finish up with science but we have english uh, language arts and mathematics um, and these uh, lesson plans are laid out by the week so from week one all the way to week uh, 36 we have already completed all that information for our uh, teachers um, uh, so Briefly, Mr. Stephen, Ms. Katrina, just give us a, a brief synopsis of what your work entails. Okay. Um, so what we did last year, um, that we started the first year of implementing our new pacing guides, and we did grades three through eight in ELA and math, as well as fifth grade science, eighth grade science, biology, English two, and math one and math two. Math three. Math three. Sorry. This year, we added... K2, we also added Math 3, and we went through and we reviewed our 
pace of guys that we had last year. We updated them with resources to support our EO learners, our AIG, our EC, and the digital learning part that we needed to cover. Uh, what you will see here, as Dr. Robert alluded to, is that we have factored in those first three weeks of school, which is going to go through the fast track curriculum that you'll hear about um, a little later. And then as of week four, that's when we are going to start our new instruction when we talk about the difference between the spring and the fall. In the spring, we were directed by the state to not deliver any new instruction, but to only do is review material. As we go into week four of the fall, that's when new instruction will start and all of our teachers will be expected to follow the pacing guides that are in place for them. And whenever you click here, all of our teachers come to our year at a glance document here. They'll click everything and it's hyperlinked into it. The unit comes up. Make it bigger. Just tap it right there and see. Does that make it bigger? That's fine. The unit comes up, and here we address this. We listed the standards that they need to address. We gave them unpacking the standards document and the text set for which it actually comes through. As we scroll down, we give them the essential questions, the learning targets. When we talk about everything being aligned to the standards, this is how we make sure all of our instruction across the district, no matter where they are, is aligned to the standards. So the only difference, well, not the only difference, one of the differences between <laughs> last year and this year is that our teachers will now have to take everything from being paper and pencil and make sure they have it hyperlinked into their Google Classroom, hyperlinked into their Canvas course. That way the students can access, complete, and submit online. Um, again, we have a, all of our texts. If we have them available online, they are here, hyperlinked where they can click on them. We have the different types of assessments for the students, for the teachers to utilize for their students, vocabulary, and then as we go down, then we actually give them a suggested scope of sequence of how they should follow and use this pacing guide. So that's going to help with the equity across the district as far as all of our students receiving the same standards of instruction. Um, in every single school. A map looks very much uh, the same as this. Uh, any teacher can take our pace of guide now. Brand new teacher can come in, get on, on the pace of guide, and they have everything they need to do. All the resources, all the resources are there. They're hyperlinked. It tells what um, pages in the textbook they need to go to. Everything is there for them. Step by step. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. All right. So uh, the the last couple of before is uh, the question was asked about our ready books. Those have been ordered and those have started coming in. So for our K eight students, hopefully they'll be in by next week. Uh, also, I want to just remind you we talked about the principals and the administrators doing walkthroughs. Also, our curriculum supervisors, these experts sitting here, our instructional coaches and also our PSRC mentors will also be doing daily walkthroughs with our teachers to make sure that we provide uh, any assistance that they may need. Uh, we're not going to go through the comparison chart because you know what? Everything you ask was in the comparison chart. And if you don't believe me, you can start reading it because I was like, wow, they could have written this comparison chart. So, uh, so when you get a chance, please, please do look at that because uh, when Dr. Mann and I met, along with the superintendent, and I think Mr. Gentry was there, they asked if we could do a comparison from last year to this year. And so the team has worked very diligently to get that done for you. So please, it talks about the time, it talks about the learning management system, the resources, the communication, the technology. Have you heard these terms tonight? The monitoring, the grading, the uh, uh, parent training, the equity, the attendance, the special populations. All those have been discussed uh, with you tonight. So uh, Ms. Karen um, has been working with us to make sure that the connectivity, the hotspots that Ms. Brenda had asked about uh, with the uh, connectivity, the broadband, and the partnerships. Um, Ms. Karen, did you want to say anything about the partnerships? Yes, I'll talk about it. Okay. Mr. Barber, excuse me. But um, show the front of that book where the comparison is so when we meet at another point, we'll know. Yes. I think that's a great talking point to come. The tab is, or, is everything's in order. But I know show the front of the book so everybody remember the book. Yeah. The front of the book. Yeah, the front of the book, the comparison chart, because that's the talking point. If parents ask you 
What's the difference in this year and last year? Right. Any question the parents may have or constituents, it's right here at your fingertips. And like I said, uh, everything's tabbed for you. So please let us know if there's anything that you need clarity on. We'll be more than happy to uh, address that with you. Ms. Karen. All right. And just to briefly touch on like devices, the um, devices to make us one-to-one -one have been ordered and they are expected to be back August the 19th, around August the 19th. Also, the find for connectivity to find permanent long-term solutions, we've been working with the North Carolina Remote Learning Work Group um, out of the governor's office, but as short-term solutions and ways to improve the connectivity for our students, um, we have invested through the CARES Act in mobile bus hotspot units. <clears throat> At the end of the year, we piloted 10 that were donated from the governor's office but um, we have invested in 39 more units that, as Dr. Guzman always reminds me, are more robust um, for and 5G capabilities. Um, each school will have their own bus. And as we talked to the principals yesterday, we talked, about, talked to them about using them together collaboratively in regions. And I just use Red Springs as an example because that's where I worked for eight years. But, you know, have one in Thunder Valley, have one in the Mill Village so that you spread that connectivity um, and that more students can take advantage of it. We also talked about having them out from eight in the morning till eight in the evening so that we have that connectivity. Also, we've been working with um, business partnerships, community partnerships, churches, and um, they've been very generous and gracious and um, willing to extend their hotspots and parking lots to our students and boys and girls. I mean, some have volunteered to set up picnic tables and porta potties, snacks, all sorts of stuff. Um, our community chart, and you can see it on the screen, um, we're filling it in, we're filling it in every day, but we made it a collaborative effort where principals and people um, within their school can reach out, add to, but also use it as a resource so parents will know where to go, uh, where they can find internet access. Um, you know, we can't necessarily always make, make it we can't put up towers everywhere right now. I mean, like, we can't do that, but we can make sure that they have access or places that they can go for internet. Um, Mr. Teal, did you want to add to that or talk about your work with the learning group, remote learning group? Or Mr. Teal, um, Vincent, did you want to talk about those less mobile hotspots? Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I don't know, either, I guess I'll probably be the one that comes in with it bad news and let you know how the district and the state as a whole is pushing to get all these devices for the hot spot, my five, whole nine yard. It's just not the state of North Carolina, it's the nation as a whole. You know, when China shuts down, everybody's trying to get all these devices at one time. So right now, we have done a diligent job trying to get with the state to give another additional 39 to, to be in uh, collaboration with Dr. Gooden has, has given. And, I think right now it's probably another 25 to come in support that 39. The reason why we got those 29 because those other counties sits in the same dilemma that we are. They don't have enough cell phone towers in those areas, so they didn't need them. So they came back and say we had a great need to get them. And so Robson County was high on the list because we are a low wealth uh, district. Also, with that being said, my team has started within the last two or three weeks going out to all the schools and trying to do what we call the coverage mapping. For example, the other day when I came through by Red Spring Middle, uh, right on the main road, I was picking up PSRC 2, but now we shut that down. We got everything pretty much robust. Everything now is back on the network as it should be as PSRC. So with that being said, our radius is almost 300 feet away from the building. So that gives us a little bit more extra mileage as far as social distance. So if these people decide to come in and group up, they won't be all clustered up in one area. We should have that information done probably by Friday. Also, with that being said, we have anywhere from 1,000 to almost 2,500 hotspots in reserve. We don't want to go out there and jump on 2,500. We only need 500 because these companies are very, very screwed in their business. If I get 2,500, I'm stuck with 2,500, and Dr. Moon going to have to pay almost $80,000 a month bill Hmm. So we're going to try to gauge this thing based on some type of needs assessment, let us know who has what. Uh, our problem is that Ross County is very dense. We're talking about Wakulla, Parkton, Long Branch, Oxendine, um, Maxton, the 
south side court of uh, Roland, um, on the, I say the eastern part of uh, Orem, Parkton, Rex Renner, all those are dense areas that don't have cell phone tower uh, coverage. So we don't know right now whether or not the modifiers will mitigate those spots and fill in the gaps before those kids don't have internet service at home. Um, Centurlink, AT&T, and Verizon has come up, almost given us the assurance that they will ramp up those coverage. Like, for example, they had 3G, 3G radius right now. They're trying to put 5G uh, in those areas. Uh, the coverage method has been given to uh, Ms. Karen Floyd and Dr. Wooten as far as the areas that, was, that seem to be the most trouble spots to us. So we try to figure out some kind of way to uh, mitigate those areas as well. Another idea that came to us is they asked you had several schools that closed. The problem with that is if those schools are still up on the E-rate, we can't take those antennas and move them to another location until we actually get those finalized. But if that does come down to fruition, what we're all going to do is actually take those devices and put them alongside the classroom and try to turn them back towards the uh, parking lot. So that will be additional coverage. Right now, the average antenna can have, handle anywhere between 25 to 40 clients. Now, the plus side of this situation is the kids not being in school right now, our network is just as like it's on steroids right now because still having 25 clients, we don't have 3,500 uh, clients on the network. So we're able to push it stronger, harder, a lot faster. Devices, right now we have on order 2,564 dice devices. As Ms. Karen said, those devices should come in around August the 19th. With that being said, we really are one to one school district. We start adding the number of Chromebooks we have. Last time I did the number for Mr. Cole, we have 19,000 plus devices with close to 9,800 that will be expired September of next year. Here's that other money we have coming in. We should be able to mitigate that problem too and get like those 12,000 to come in to take care of that, that outage. Also, with that being said, we started just yesterday bringing our team. So when all these teachers come back in, we got a team member right now help desk. So if folks start to come in need issues concern at school without us running out there possibly take, bringing COVID with us, they'll be able to call in to us and try to resolve the issues remotely. Also, with that being said, we're going to try to establish staggered hours. So if people are doing, um, I guess, studies after 5 or 6 o'clock, we'll be able to push that thing all the way up to 9 o'clock and help take care of those situations as well. I know I'm staying a lot fast. Um, other than that, folks, those probably about the brightest side that we have. Um, other, other than trying to get in line with the rest of the nation to try to get in maybe another 12,000 Chromebooks. Any questions of me? For Dr. Emanuel, who still, you still the chairperson. You and then Mr. Terry. You go ahead. Okay. So Mr. Teal, Parents can use their own computers because a lot of them been buying computers also. They'll be able to still use and access with their computers. Okay, I just want to make certain I gave them the proper information. That's, that's correct. Okay, will there be anything they need to tag in with PSRC? No, ma'am. These devices are plug and play and walk away. Okay, thank you. If we activate one of the, um, the MiFi devices, does that put us into a contract or anything? Or is it on a month to month? That's one of the negotiations that we're trying to get in place right now. Hopefully get the first 90 days where we can walk away without any year-long options. But as a whole, across the United States, everybody's locking into a year contract. You know, because we don't know if it's going to last till December. And then if we walk away in 90 days, where the price might be $15, we come back in October, it might be $60. So that's money wasted. So we're trying to figure out what strategy we can use to make sure we don't waste the money. Okay, any more questions? Do we still get that FCC money that we pay on our phone bill? We still get in that money? That's E rate. That's right. Uh, it don't pay for that anymore. The only thing it pays for is actual connectivity to the building itself. Okay. Other small devices like the MiFi, the Wi Fi, the Hotspot, it, it won't support. They'll do that no more. Okay, we need a new Congress. Oh, if they you finish. Did you have something, Mr. Guzman? It was just to follow up, not to, to go through. I think I've talked a lot and spoken to a lot of you about what we're doing with these Wi-Fi, especially on the buses. They are not the typical ones that we were given out at the beginning. 
uh, those issues. These are more robust units that also have analytic capabilities to where we will be able to throttle down social media and other things to limit what those students are on versus our learning platform. So with the stroke of any point, you can go on, look at what they're doing, find the percentages, and then to deal with those, to limit either of those accesses, and to also deal with the broadband issues to help that to push those to those uh, uh, learning management systems and into those websites that we're doing. Like uh, Everett, uh, Mr. Teal talked about, our units will be able to tie into those as he's pushing those out. So we will be able to theoretically be able to put buses in strategic locations and cover a whole entire parking lot and or ball fields to do a park and learn, meaning that it's like an old school drive-in is the best way to put it. Within four of these units, I could go ahead in Southeastern Agricultural Center and actually blanket that whole entire location with Wi-Fi so that we can have people to pull up and to be able to go ahead. Um, we have been talking, as uh, Mr. Teal has talked about, working very diligently with the telecommunications uh, providers here. I can honestly say U.S. Cellular has been very active. Orem, recently in the 7476 corridor, has put up a new tower. There's also been a new tower put up in, uh, in the St. Paul's area to help expand. Now, of course, yes, we still have needs down in the Roland area in the south end of this county. But we are doing everything in our availability to make sure that we're having that. We're just going to need some help on some other ends to be able to have those towers to be put up. And that's something that is, of course, out of our scope and range. But once that happens, we have the capability right now of what we're doing to be able to expand that. We just need that help because even though we talk about Wi-Fi and the, these little jetpacks, it's not an instantaneous thing of pushing a button and then getting connectivity. And um, believe me, um, we have made it very clear with all of the vendors that we are working with um, to make sure that they understand where our areas of need are and that that's a priority for us, especially if, if for, for anything moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Also, <coughs> Dr. May, add to that, all these devices, be it the one on the bus or the Wi-Fi or the jetpack, We'll have our agent on it. So little ever can't sit at home and go places he or she should not go. We'll have a blocking agent on it to block stuff like porn, anything else that's inappropriate. They should not be Thank on you. our device or that network piece of block. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your presentation. I want to thank the staff. Uh, Dr. Dr. Robert, I'm already in trouble with time now, but go ahead. <laughs> just need Jadale to make this one statement and we'll be out of the way about it. I know, Dr. I, had, I noticed Ms. Jadale hadn't been up there, so. <laughs> get, get him. Dr. Wooten, Chairman Lowry, <laughs> I want to pass the top very quickly. The rating policy for this year will yeah. remain the same as it was last year. We are trying to transition our students back into a brick and mortar. Um, environment. So in order to keep that process in place, we still need to hold up our grading policy and we will do that. So the grading policy will remain in place, will remain the same as it has been for them to transition back into brick and mortar and I am done. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. We are now finished. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> what we tried to do tonight, and it was lengthy, and, I, and I, I'm not going to apologize because school's about teaching and learning and we had to I do want to ask the curriculum committee tonight, you see this book you have in your hand? We're asking for a recommendation. I'm asking for a recommendation from the curriculum committee that we can take this to the full board as our curriculum document, distance learning resources uh, for approval, take it to the full board. And we just need the votes of the curriculum committee that we could do that. We got to, can we do that? Can that we go forth, Dr. I, Manuel? I second. All right. Curriculum committee, are we okay with that? Everybody? Curriculum committee, that's Mr. Jansen, Mr. Terry, Mr. Bonte, and Ms. Brenda. Aye. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. And doctors, uh, superintendents, fine with it, and board chairs, fine with it. I do want to make two comments before we dismiss this committee. Uh, uh, um, regardless of all the resources we have, the key instrument in teaching and learning is the teacher. I mean, you can have all the, all these resources we heard tonight, but the teacher's the key. And I talked with a parent quietly tonight or earlier to this afternoon. Be very careful with those little children that are coming to school that have never been to school before. Mm -hmm. 
just slap a computer in front of their faces and say, okay, what do you do? You go to distance learning. You have to start with the love of teaching and learning, the love of reading or something with those children. They've never been to school in their lives. So those I've been working with early education, be very careful how you start with those children. I would encourage you to start with the love of reading because you're formulating their idea of whether they love school or they do not love school then because they haven't been. But anyway, I want to thank everybody. Thank all of you. It's just thank been a wonderful. This just makes me happy. Thank you so much for what you've done. Go ahead. Okay. One quick question, Dr. Bank. Um, can, can the public go back and watch this here? Can they go to like PSRC um, and pull this up right here? This we can meeting put, tonight. We can put the link on our homepage. Okay. So that way we can say, Go to the link that we sat there for two hours and Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> it's supposed to be four hours, sorry. Yeah. And we, we can link this too. Mr. Dwayne, the important thing in this book, if they asked you or any of us, is that comparison chart, what it was last year and what it's going to be this year. I think that's a telling thing, is it's, it's different. And we hope, and the important thing is the teacher. Dr. Main, Dr. The spectrum has been, has been uh, advocating other school districts coming out and showing how they're going to be starting up. I would really love for them to do us also. Yeah, since they say they're reaching out to us to show what it will be. I was committed. I don't think that's going to last long. Um, I'd love to see y'all face on the table. <laughs> Sarah, my team. Finished. Folks, I got, uh, I got, well, first, thank you, Dr. Manuel. Yeah. And, and folks, I don't know if you counted, now I did. <laughs> There's 11 board members and there's 11 here tonight. Yeah. Now, uh, and all the committee was here. Somebody might have said, well, why didn't we do all that tonight? Well, we couldn't do it tonight. Uh, Mr. Mike keeps me straight. We got a board meeting next Tuesday. Formally, it's got to be done at the board meeting. So I said 7.43, it's 7.44. Uh, let's come back at 7.50. You want to stand up and stretch real quick? Just stand up, Mr. Gentry. Then you and Ms. Karen will go. Thank Just you, stand up and stretch. You Just take straight. a minute. We'll do that, then we'll do the policy. <laughs>
and so I don't have to do it afterward. Uh, there is a construction committee meeting Tuesday, next Tuesday before the board meeting. It's at five o'clock. A couple items come up. We need to cover that. There's some deadlines on that, so there'll be a construction committee meeting next Tuesday at five o'clock. Uh, Miss Brenda Fur, just so you know, uh, you are on the construction committee since I did leave off. He left a female off. <laughs> We're now on the construction committee. I don't want you getting me for that. Okay. Uh, on the uh, construction, um, excuse me, the policy committee, Mr. Chair, Gentry's chairman, Ms. Brenda Furby, Mr. Dwayne Smith, Mr. John Simmons, and Mr. Henry Brewer. And again, I'm glad to say all the members are here. So, uh, Mr. Gentry, you and uh, uh, Ms. Karen Brooks Floyd, before I turn it over to you, I will say there's some comments in here about letting the board attorney look at this. And so recommendations you have tonight, we'll make sure he has a copy of this tomorrow so he can look at it. And if he needs to give us any input Tuesday night. Okay, okay thank you. Yes, sir, thank you, <coughs> Hagen. I need to go. I think, again, thank all of you for, for being here. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to be a part of this illustrious group. And I, and I, I just want to say, and, and I have said it to many people that I've had the opportunity is that uh, our administrative staff and our board is is leaving no stones unturned in helping the students to get all the, the help and instruction that they need. I, I and I believe our community is very impressed, Dr. Wooten, with what is what is taking place and uh, and, and it just increased uh, my already uh, good feeling about being a part of this organization as a, as a board member. Uh, we, you have before you uh, a book that's fairly thick, and uh, this has just come to us within the last, what, Ms. Craig, a, a week, Dr. Wooten, about a week. And, uh, and it came, of course, from uh, DPI, and the, 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 uh, the letter says uh, that it's time, time sensitive and that the, the new policies will go into effect on uh, August 14th, which of course is, is next Tuesday. Uh, and so the policy changes, and I'll call your attention to the very first page because it, it is quite thick and uh, it will take you some time to read all the way through this and to digest it. Uh, and I think it's ironic that uh, the season that we're in, uh, the issues to which these changes pertain, uh, to some extent, to a lot of extent, are not relevant right now because they take place in a group setting, whether it's group or individual interaction. And, and of course, uh, in the school setting, at least, that's not happening right now. Uh, it does address cyberbullying, which of course uh, takes place uh, via the internet. But I'll call your attention to the uh, the new policies and administrative regulations uh, in the update, uh, and they are listed for you uh, by number and by heading uh, or by title, and those are the ones that are already in existence. If you go to the uh, link on uh, Public Schools Robinson County website and uh, access the, uh, the link for policies, uh, these are already part of the uh, policy manual for the Public Schools Robinson County. And uh, these are, are updates uh, to those, and, and you will find, when you do read through this, of course, you will find each of these addressed uh, individually. Uh, the, well, the, the first group is new policies, the second group is updated policies, and uh, the last two are policies uh, which must be removed from the policy manual because they're in direct conflict with uh, new policies that, that have been added. And once again, uh, I'll emphasize that uh, these policies are, are for it really are 
for information only. They do not require uh, board action, as I understand it. Uh, somebody may correct me on that. My, my interpretation is that uh, this is for the information for our staff and for our board uh, that uh, these policies are uh, are being changed or, or are being initiated as per uh, the list and then the, the subsequent uh, documentation and comprehensive and, and some of them do get quite wordy. Uh, uh, Ms. Karen and I were talking a while ago that uh, we possibly could make a recommendation uh, with some of the wording uh, if we thought uh, some a different phrase. And in fact, the one that she pointed out to me had to do with the phrase body parts, I believe. Right, on the administrative regulation. Right. And uh, we, we may want to consider some uh, recommendations uh, of, about some of the wording and phrasing. Uh, a lot of it does seem redundant. And if you look at the existing uh, policies and then look at the proposed updating or new policies, uh, just at a glance, there seems to be very little difference. Uh, although, uh, uh, it, when you do read through this, and all you have to do is hold it in your hand to realize that it, it is quite voluminous, a lot to it, but uh, I don't see where there is uh, a major departure in uh, the thinking and the philosophy uh, behind it, and that is to protect uh, everyone, uh, staff, <coughs> students, uh, visitors, uh, guests on campus, uh, to both protect them uh, and to, uh, as a warning, uh, just as we are protected, we are also forewarned that uh, if, if any of these actions are indulged in, that there will be, uh, be consequences that will, uh, that will follow. Uh, as we all know, uh, we live in a, uh, a time when uh, these issues are much more sensitive uh, than they were at one time, and they do bear uh, constant review and, uh, with the, and with possible changes recommended as are here. And again, uh, this is actually for information only and does not require board action. Am I right, Mr. Craig? Well, um, yes, let me let me add, uh, Mr. Tanner, and I'll get your question. Let me just add this. Folks, um, and I don't know if we said this before, especially for the new members, we contracted with the state, with the, the school board association a uh, few years ago to help rewrite our policy manual. And what they do, they periodically will send us stuff. And some, a lot of times we might get it like now, and we've got until October to get it in. Or it's, we might even have longer than that. So this is one of those things, and it happens to where we got it a couple of weeks ago, and if you read the front of this year, uh, it says by August 14th you got to have it. So we will end up having to approve it, but when you get to looking at this, so most of this stuff says required, uh, which means We've, it's got to be done. Right. So it's basically one of those things tonight, and Mr. Gentry can get like a motion that that this would be presented, and you look at it, and if you have a question Tuesday, instead of having what we call a reading and then doing it later on, since it's got to be in by the 14th, if you have a question or want something changed, we could change it Tuesday night, and if not, it would be approved Tuesday, pending that the attorney will, like I said, get to look at it if he has a question, but. For our practical purposes, we've got to approve it Tuesday night to meet that August 14th deadline. So, uh, again, if you hadn't seen this and hadn't got to read through it, it's hard to do it sitting here as thick as this thing is. You go look at it, and if you find something you need to highlight on page whatever, then Tuesday we can look at it. And if you don't have anything then, we'll just, uh, you know, make, take the recommendation pending what happened tonight, and we'll get it approved. I think that's basically, you know, where I'm thinking, Mr. Karen, pretty much what we had done with these yes. things in the past. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll let you go back. Mr. Henry had a question, I think, and then Ms. Brown. As a policy member, um, I would think that you would have to be very careful with the wording as far as legality is concerned. And if this has came through and down by the State Department, uh, I think we could spend many, many hours discussing line items that we're just wasting a lot of time in a sense that, you know, because of the wording could be because of legal issues that could proceed. Um, I would, I would su like to suggest that we expediently go ahead and take care of this and give it to the attorney to look at so that the total board could approve it. Our next he's board. gonna get it tomorrow. He's, he's and he, I think he might already have a copy, but he's gonna have it because we like I said we've got to approve it Tuesday night. We don't have no and when we talk about like changing a word or something in here, we do have the opportunity, the state gives us the opportunity that we can change a few things, but like you said, when it's written out like this and said required, there's very few things that we do change. Very seldom. And then where they give us some leeway. There are certain places in here they might say recommended. If when you go to looking through here, those are places a word or two might be changed. And really the only way to get into it and see it is just to sit down and read it. But pretty much when they send us something, they did the research, they right. work. That's why we contracted out with them right. to do this for us. Because I'm saying this looks like this. I don't know if we had all this on paper, folks. Would it be this high? <laughs> It, 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 it might be. I'm just literally saying if all this policy was on paper, it would be unbelievable high. But we pretty much go with what they what they get in there. Because I, I, I'm saying what I said, too, because I'm not sure at what extent our attorney, Mr. Grady, would want to be involved in, in saying this is legal or not. Mm. I mean, I understand he's a resource for us to use, but yeah. would, would the total burden come back to the state level? Well, the statutes and everything sent here, and we've always never had any issues. They send this, and he looks at it. We've never had any issues with it while I've been here. Mr. And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Dedrick, uh, because you said there may be some things that may want to be changed, do, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> Chairman, if you do see something that you think that need to be, if you could go ahead and send that information to Grady ahead of time, it could be ready by Tuesday night or any board member. Change it in Dr. Wood, was there anything in here that you wanted different? Okay. And even if we approve it Tuesday night and there are minor changes, you don't have to go through the full policy to make minor adjustments if you don't change the meaning of actual policy. So. And it's cross-referenced with the general statutes, the applicable general statutes at the bottom of the policies. So they, they cross-reference those and usually provide a chart with the updates. And could you go over how they do it with the red, with the light, and what it's yeah, yeah. Once you read it or while you read it, uh, there is a, a question or a concern. I, I think your point's well taken. If you highlight, go ahead and, and, and highlight that. I, I, obviously, we don't need to get too. But you know, if there's something that does that does concern any of us as board members. Uh, yes, I, by all means, I would say uh, you know, go ahead and highlight it, and, uh, and we don't want to get bogged down in too much of a discussion. But uh, but at the same time, if there if there is a concern, that's part of the reason for sending it uh, to the full board meeting uh, on Tuesday night. So part of the weekend reading, and, uh, and we'll come back Tuesday night and go from there. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Brenda, sir. Part of the red was I was going to make sure Mr. Grady saw that. Right. right. I'm going to make sure he sees that. Right. Part. Right. That's all because I know if he sees it in advance, we'll do it. Okay. So do we need do we do we need to approve this, Mr. Craig, or 
vote or anything to move this to Tuesday night or anything, or just just making us aware of everything right now. It's on the agenda for next week. It's on the agenda, and probably there'd be a you know a recommendation. It could be Tuesday night. Right. Recommendation <coughs> Tuesday night that we move it to action for approval. And pending Mr. Grady saying everything's okay. Right. If somebody has a question, just like I said, try to get it to Mr. Gentry and we can take care of that beforehand. And we can okay. get all that cleaned up. But I think other than Mr. Grady, if there's a question, it's probably going to come that he sees something here that he's got a question with. We can get it all approved Tuesday. I did a beat. To make you aware, so we didn't come in Tuesday and it was like, here's this thing now, we need to do it tonight. Yeah. I'm going to make the motion. We're good. Wait, don't worry. Pretty good. Everybody good? Good. Pretty good. Motion nice to adjourn. Second. 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 All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Have a good one. I want to stay long.